Good morning. Previous to this scripture, Luke 17, the Savior's been teaching the masses. He's faced up to his enemies. And he has just come out of the great story of Lazarus and the rich man, talking about justice and restitution at our death. He said to his disciples, it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come, but woe to him through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than that he would cause one of these little ones to stumble. Be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times saying, I repent, forgive him. The apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you have faith, like a mustard seed. You would say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and be planted in the sea and it would obey you. Which of you, having a slave plowing or tending sheep, would say to him when he comes in from the field, come immediately and sit down and eat? But will you not say, prepare something for me to eat and pro properly clothe yourself and serve me while I eat and drink? Afterward, you may eat and drink. He does not thank the slave because he did the things which were commanded, does he? So you too. When you do all the things which are commanded you, say, we are unworthy slaves. We have done only which we ought to do, what we ought to have done. Verse 1 says that Jesus spoke to his disciples. They were there right there in front of him. They were gathered around him. And yes, what he said was picked up on by those closest to him. But let's make sure we understand who he's talking to. He's talking to people on the periphery. He's talking to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Jesus talks about stumbling blocks. That's who he's talking to. Jesus talks about the workers doing their work and not expecting to be fed first, but be fed last, put others ahead of themselves, and be grateful in doing so to their master. Yes, Jesus is speaking in front of his disciples who are gathered around, but he's talking to the Pharisees. He's talking to the people who should know better. As Theophilus continues to read this letter, this gospel, that was written to him specifically, from one Gentile to another, he's picking up on what's going on. It's obvious to me that, that he received this from Luke because he inquired about Jesus. You're not going to write by hand the gospel of Luke and the Acts of the Apostles just on the random chance that one person might want to read it. This was something that Theophilus had requested. And so as he continues to read about the life and ministry of Jesus, 
there's got to be some things clicking in his head about what's going on. As Monty said, Jesus just finished the story of the rich man and Lazarus. And it's obvious who the rich man is in the story. And the message that Jesus is communicating, I think, in a very powerful way, and in about the most direct, indirect way you possibly can. The wheels in their heads are turning. Everybody's heads. Those that are right there in front of him, but those that are, that are on the edge, the periphery. Their wheels in their minds are turning as well. They're getting angry. They're whispering amongst each other, what are we going to do about this guy? I mean, he's indirectly calling us out in front of the people, making fools of us. It's building. It's building. But they're not going anywhere. They're going to stay right where they are. Because they want to hear more, not because they want to benefit from it, but because they want to know what Jesus is saying about them. And if there's something that they can use against him. And so Theophilus reading this, I, I think, you know, he probably has heard the story here and there, but he's getting a first-hand account from Luke at this point. And Theophilus is, you know, believed to be an intelligent man, a Roman, a Gentile, of some standing. He's putting it all together and wondering what's coming next as the story continues. Here, as we transition into chapter 17, we, we see Jesus make a statement in verses 1 and 2, powerful to those seated close to him, but directed at those beyond. And he talks about four questions, I think, that we can get from this text, about questions that we, as disciples, as those called by God to lead others to Christ, that we need to ask. These are not easy questions. They're difficult questions. We have to ask them as believers, as disciples. But more importantly than asking them, family, we have to answer them. So before we get into the message this morning, I'd like for us to go together to God in prayer. Let's pray. Our Lord and our God, we thank you so much for every blessing of this day. What a beautiful thing this morning, the rain that you sent upon us. To let us know that you send us just exactly what we need when we need it in your time. And we're so thankful for that. We're thankful for all the blessings because you treat them the same way. You send us exactly what we need in your time for our benefit. And Lord, I know there are people here this morning and joining us online, maybe watching this at a later time. There are things that they need. There are things that they want. There are answers that they're looking for. And they're praying. But the answers and the needs have not come and have not been met as of yet. Lord, I just pray that you give them the faith and the patience to trust you. To fully trust you. And knowing that you will give and you will deliver what we need when we need it on your time. Spirit, I pray that this message this morning is your message. I feel inadequate to deliver it. I need you to fill the gap. I need you, Spirit, to carry me through this. I feel that way because I, I, something tells me that it's, 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 a, it's a difficult message. And so, Spirit, I pray that it's yours, not mine. And that you will open our hearts and our minds to what the Word has to say today. Lord, you've, you've been so good to us in, in so many ways. We have many difficult challenges going on in our world and in our country right now. And Lord, we need you now more than ever. And so Lord, I pray that you will work in the way that only you can to touch the hearts of people and to bring our country and our world to a more peaceful existence. Lord, we love you, we praise you, we thank you in all things, in Jesus' name, amen. In the Great Commission, Jesus says, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing 
and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. We're all familiar with that, right? Most of us can quote it. But here's the thing. Sometimes we get the order of that backwards. Meaning that we get the cart before the horse, so to speak. In the sense that we set out to baptize, then make disciples. And for some reason, when people come up out of the water, they tend to get left on their own. Family, being a disciple and making disciples is something that has become a lost art. But it is a necessary process that ensures the future of the church. Our congregation here in Mesquite is coming up on 85 years, very quickly. And depending on how we view making disciples is going to determine whether this congregation is here another 85 years. Family, we need to become much better at making disciples. And in order to be a disciple, family, that Jesus calls us to be and to make disciples that each and every one of us have been called to do, there's some important questions we have to ask, very difficult questions that we must not only be willing to ask ourselves, but we really need to be willing to answer them. In our text that Monty read just a moment ago, Jesus has just finished the story of the rich man and Lazarus. And he's painted a picture of the afterlife, that those who follow God's commands are delivered by the angels to Abraham's side. And Jesus gives us the conversation that takes place in the afterlife. Lazarus was delivered to Abraham's side, but yet the rich man was, he didn't make it there. He finds himself, family, in everlasting torment. And Jesus has just made this statement, quoting the words of Abraham in chapter 16, verse 31. He says, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. Family, the they here are the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. If the Pharisees and teachers of the law do not listen to Moses and the prophets, of which they are experts in, by the way, they, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, will not be convinced by anything including someone who rises from the dead. Family, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, when we pick up in chapter 17, verse 1, they're still chewing on that mentally. They're still trying to figure that one out. They're dealing with different emotions. They're getting angry. They're saying things in their own mind like, did he say what I, just, I think he just said? How dare he say that about us? They're still working this over mentally when Jesus focuses the conversation on his disciples as we transition into chapter 17. And Jesus knows full well the Pharisees are listening. Verses 1 to 10, Jesus encourages those in the crowd then and family. He encourages you and I today to ask four important questions that we need to ask ourselves relating to our discipleship. The first question is, are we leading others in the wrong direction? We need to ask that question. When we step back and we look at ourselves and how we conduct ourselves, uh, the way we treat other people, are we leading others in the wrong direction? Verses 1 to 3, Jesus says to his disciples, things that cause people to stumble are bound to come. But woe to anyone through whom they come. It would be better for them to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around their neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. So watch yourselves. Take a good look at that. Look at what Jesus is saying there. Consider the environment. What does that sound like? What does that look like? Who's there and who's where? Jesus is speaking. The, the people that 
or outcasts are at the front, the sinners, the tax collectors, okay? According to the Pharisees, the refuse of society, they're right there. And the Pharisees and teachers of the law are in the back when Jesus says that. Regardless, family, of how much we pray, regardless of how much we serve, regardless of how much Scripture we read and memorize, family, there will be temptations that come our way for the purpose of causing us to stumble. Satan knows our weaknesses. He knows exactly what your buttons are, and he knows exactly when to push them. He knows what temptations to send our way to entice us to slip and cause us to stumble. Family, we're never as strong as we think we are. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, Paul reminds us of that. He says, if you think you're standing firm, be careful. Be careful that you don't fall. Family, that's a reminder. What you see on the screen right there, that is a reminder that we can allow ourselves to be led in the wrong direction. But family, a bigger thing that we need to consider is that we can lead others in the wrong direction. Notice again what Jesus says in verse 1. He says, things that cause people to stumble are bound to come. It's a fact of life. We live in a fallen world. It's going to happen. He says they're bound to come. But look at what he says next. But woe to anyone through whom they come. In the first part of verse 1, Jesus states the reality that each and every one of us faces in a world where Satan roams. Stumbling blocks are bound to come your way. That is a fact of life. But in the latter half of verse 1, he makes it personal. In effect saying, just make sure that you are not the stumbling block. Family, in the latter half of verse 1, Jesus says, but woe to anyone through whom they come. Brothers and sisters, Jesus says that to his disciples. He says that right here to the people that are right in front of him. But let me tell you who he's talking to. He's talking to the people out there. He's got their attention. He's talking to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who are always within earshot. And family, I have to believe that when he said that to those that were right there in front of him, he turned his head and he said it directly, making eye contact with the people that he was talking to. Again, Jesus has their attention. And in verse 2, he makes the consequence of being a stumbling block very clear in what he says. Look at what he says. It would be better for them... For them to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around their neck than to cause one of these little ones, the sinners, the tax collectors, these little ones in the faith to stumble. Take a good look at that. The them that he is speaking to, family, is the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And in my mind, again, I see him looking directly at them when he says it. Now, being thrown into the sea with a millstone weighing up to maybe three, four, five hundred pounds was scary enough in and of itself. Okay, but we have to remember the times that they're living in. And we have to remember the culture that they were living in. During this time in Jewish culture, being drowned in the sea was horrific. And the reason why is because the sea was considered to be a bottomless abyss and it was symbolic of chaos and it was symbolic of hell. Dying by drowning in the ocean was the worst possible death for these people. And you know, quite honestly, Family, this is a rather interesting statement for Jesus to make 
in the presence of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law following the story of the rich man and Lazarus, don't you think? You see, in my mind, again, Jesus is looking directly at them when he gives this warning. With regard to the little ones that have gathered close to him, don't be stumbling blocks to these little ones. I see this as an indirect confrontation between Jesus and the Pharisees. Because he knows they're listening. You may see it differently. But I try to visualize what I read in the Scriptures when I read the Scriptures. I try to put myself there as a bystander. Seeing, hearing, smelling witnessing what's going on and that's what i see but you know as we read this i wonder how theophilus is seeing this in his mind as he reads it for the first time the pharisees and the teachers of the law family have been leading people in the wrong direction and jesus is calling them out for it Again, family, the question that you and I need to ask ourselves is are we leading others in the wrong direction? So how do we do that? How do we lead others in the wrong direction in our day and in our culture? There's three ways I want to touch on. First, we lead others in the wrong direction the same way that the Pharisees did. We do it through false teaching that ignores Scripture to support our preferences and through promoting Scripture that emphasizes our preferences. Family, there are believers in this world, people who claim to be believers in Christ that ignore the necessity of baptism in the salvation process. And they ignore it because they ignore the Scriptures that clearly point to it. They also, family, Ignore the possibility of losing their salvation because they promote scriptures that support their once saved, always saved theology. That's how we see it, for example, in the world that we live in today. For example, Billy Graham, Franklin Graham. Franklin Graham's on TV all the time. You've seen the commercials. They have misled millions of people, millions of people into believing that they can be saved by simply saying a prayer while they're on the television without any scriptural support whatsoever for that. And here's the thing, the majority of the Christian world has bought into that. Family, are we misleading others? Are we leading them in the wrong direction? Second, we lead others in the wrong direction when we try to validate and justify our sins and the sins of others. When we say, family, that Jesus is our Lord and Savior, but we make choices that clearly communicate that He isn't, we're leading others in the wrong direction. How so? When we pray like an apostle in church and cuss like a sailor at home, when we put on the mask of a happy marriage and we argue all the way to church and we argue all the way home, family, the whole time that's going on, our children have a front row seat to it. They have a front row seat to our hypocrisy as they sit in the back seat. Remember what Jesus says in our passage about causing little ones to stumble. Name of the Lord has called us to be disciples and to make disciples, but never forget 
that the discipling process begins at home. I mean, we also lead people in the wrong direction when we tell them that God understands their sin. That's dangerous. It's okay. God understands your weakness. God understands your sin. That's dangerous. Family, when believers get into the practice of telling people who are clearly and deliberately living a life in opposition to God's word, saying, hey, it's okay. It's okay. God understands. When we do that, we are leading them astray by justifying their sin. We just validated it. That's the society we live in today. And Christian people, rather than standing up for the Lord and against the deviancy, quite honestly, that is taking place all around us, we validate it and we justify it by accepting it. We can't do that. Let me tell you something about Devin. Let me tell you what Devin will and will not do. I can't sp speak for you. I can't speak for my wife. I can't speak for my family. I can only speak for me. Let me tell you something. As a disciple of Jesus, I will not tell you that you are justified in having an affair in your unhappy marriage. As a disciple of Jesus, I will not tell you that it is okay for you to embezzle money from your employer because you feel like you're underpaid. As a disciple of Jesus, regardless of how popular it is in the world that we live in today, I will not address you by your preferred pronoun. It may be your preference, but God created you as you are. And it would be an insult to him for me to address you in that way. Okay? These are tough things. Family, I will not tell you that you need a drink regardless of how hard of a day you've had. But... As a disciple of Jesus, I will also strive to not fail to do my very best to love you and to help you in your struggle to overcome your sin. Regardless of what that sin happens to be, it doesn't matter. Love, unconditional love, does not categorize sin. I will not fail. I will strive to not fail to help you overcome it if you are committed to overcoming it. I will not justify it, but I will help you overcome it. Family, that is what a disciple has been called to do. And we need more disciples that are willing to lovingly answer that call in the world that we live in today. Because we're only hurting others and ourselves when we validate sin. Third, we lead others in the wrong direction through our silence. Family, when we see the opportunity to lead other believers in the right direction and choose to ignore that calling by the Spirit... Family, we then consent to their sin. The Latin phrase, quitaset consitiri viditur, means he who is silent is understood to consent. Family, there are too many silent believers. There are too many silent believers in this world. And for us as a believer to see another believer clearly heading in the wrong direction and we do nothing about it we lead them in the wrong direction by allowing them to continue in that direction when we do that we are accountable 
Family, when it comes to sin, not my monkey, not my circus. And see no evil, hear no evil, do no evil is not a valid excuse. The second question we need to ask is, are we learning to forgive? Family, this isn't a suggestion from the Lord. It's a command. It's a command that never includes the conjunction if. Well, I'll forgive you if. I'll forgive them if. I'll let it go if. There is no if for the believer. There is no if when it comes to forgiveness for the disciple. Family, our forgiveness of others is not based upon the conditions that we set. It is based upon a response, our response to the command of Jesus. Look at what he says in verses 3 and 4. He says, If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day, and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. I take a good look at that. I personally have never experienced that. Seven times? Hadn't been there yet. But Jesus is telling you and telling me, be prepared to go there and beyond. Take a good look at it. Notice there's two parts to that command. To begin with, we are to rebuke a brother or sister who sins against us. What does that mean? What does it mean to rebuke someone? Let me tell you something. It's not what you think it means. It is not what you think it means. The word that's used there is the Greek word epitimao, and it consists of two parts. The first part, epi, is a preposition, meaning above. It's combined with the verb timao, which means to fix a value to. So what does that mean? To rebuke someone, family, means to value them above the issue. Family, if you value your brother, if you value your sister, then you will value their spiritual well-being enough to correct them regarding their sin. However, we got to remember something. It's a two-way street. It works both ways. We must be open to rebuke when we're in the wrong. Family, attitude matters. Attitude matters when we're in the wrong or if we have been wronged. And accountability works both ways. Okay, so the person responds. The person responds to our rebuke with their repentance. There's another part. The second part of the command is to forgive. Okay. So what does it mean to forgive? I'm going to tell you a second time. It's not what you think it is. The word in the original language is afiemi. And it means to send away or separate or omit. Family, it means more than letting go of something. It means to send it away from you, to separate it from you, to omit it from you. The it here, we need to understand what the it is. The it here is not the person. It's the offense that they committed against us. And so, family, this means that we don't hold the issue against someone. Why? Because if we have truly forgiven, then we have sent the offense away. We've sent it away and have separated ourselves from the offense because we have fixed a value to the person that supersedes the offense. Family, it is in the act of forgiveness that you and I are most Christ-like in our walk with the Lord. Determining whether a person is repentant enough, family is above our pay grade. That responsibility belongs to the Lord only. 
The third question we need to ask is, are we living by faith? It's a song that we sing. It's a song most of us can sing without the book or the slides. It's a song that we sing, but family, is it a goal that we strive for? Living by faith. The twelve could see that what Jesus has just presented them with regarding the forgiveness of others was above and beyond the eye for an eye precedent that the law had established. And understandably, they make a request of Jesus in verse 5. Listen to what they say. The apostle said, Lord, increase our faith. We can't do this on what we've got. Increase our faith. They realize that the truth of forgiving someone, letting the offense go and separating themselves from it rather than the person who committed it against us is something that's going to take more faith than they've got. And if truth be told, we're the same way. So how would Jesus respond? He says to them in verse 6, If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea and it will obey you. A family of mustard seed is slightly larger than a poppy seed. I don't eat mustard seed anything, but I could eat some, you know, some poppy seed chicken. I can, I can deal with that. So I got to find something comparative that I can relate to and I can relate to poppy seed chicken. So, a mustard seed is slightly larger than a poppy seed, but a mulberry tree, and I've never seen a mulberry tree in my life. It's not, I don't think they're indigenous to Texas. But a mulberry tree family can grow between 35 feet and 50 feet high. That's three and a half to five stories high. It's a big tree. And Jesus tells them, and he tells you, and he tells me, that a small amount of faith can accomplish very, very big things. And you may be saying to yourself, seated in your pew, joining us online, maybe at a later time watching online, you may be saying to yourself, I don't have that kind of faith. Family, the reason why is because we choose to live by safe and live by faith. Living by safe family means that we want to be in control of the outcome because we trust ourselves more than we trust the Lord. And family, that is the case for most of us. And here's the deal. Don't miss this. We will never know how powerfully God can work in our lives until we trust Him enough to let Him work. As disciples, are we living by faith? Or are we living by safe? That right there could be the biggest difference in why things are not happening in your life the way that you would like for them to happen. You're not letting God work. Fourth question we need to ask ourselves is this. Are we serving the Lord or are we serving ourselves? And in verses 7 to 10, Jesus addresses this question. He says, suppose one of you has a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down and eat? Won't he rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink, and after that you may eat and drink? Will he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants, we have only done our duty. Now think about who's there. Is he saying that to the tax collectors and the sinners? Look at that. Is that something that you would say to someone of little faith? Is that something that you would say to the outcasts and dregs of society? Or is that something that you would say to the people who are responsible, who are the leaders, who should know better, and who have fallen short? Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. He's pointing out their shortcomings. In effect, he's putting them in their place, and rightfully so. 
But you know what? It's real easy for us to look down on the Pharisees and the teachers of the law and miss the point. How does that apply to us? How does that right there apply to you and me as a disciple? Somebody who's been a baptized believer for 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 or more years. How does it apply? Family, what Jesus is saying there is that God doesn't owe us anything. God never owes us anything. As disciples, we serve the Lord out of gratification, not expectation. Are we leading others in the wrong direction? Are we learning to forgive? Are we living by faith? And are we serving the Lord or serving ourselves? Family, these are tough questions for us as disciples of Jesus to ask ourselves. But are we willing to answer them? Answering them begins by getting right with Jesus. And so that's what it boils down to. That's what invitation time is all about. Are you right with the Lord? You know what? That right there is pretty much a yes or no question. You're either right or you ain't. Either everything is good. I mean, yeah, situation, circumstances, there's things going on. You're waiting for answer to prayer. You're kind of battling with that living by faith and living by safe equation. But otherwise, everything's good. You're right with God. I can tell you this, when you're not right with the Lord, you know it. You know it. If you're not right with the Lord this morning, you need to get right. You need to get right. That's what the invitation is about. There's all kinds of questions that go through your mind and thoughts like, oh man, nobody's going to understand what I did and where I'm at. That's a lie from Satan. People are going to, you're going to say to yourself, well, man, I can't make that walk all the way down. You know what? You don't have to. Find one of our shepherds. That's, what, that's part of their role, to shepherd you, to love you, to encourage you. We're all sheep here, right? Find a shepherd. Let him wrap his arms around you and tell you that he loves you and that he's here for you and ready to listen to you and pray with you and pray for you. Walk in the aisle ain't your thing. Don't worry about it. That's only been around for about 100 years. Okay, find a shepherd or find a brother or sister in Christ that you know loves you. But if you're not right with the Lord, you got to fix that. Don't let anything stop you from that. If you're looking for a church home and you're visiting with us today, we are so glad that you're here. And please let us visit with you, get to know you a little bit better after we're done here. But if you've been visiting with us for a while and you are looking for a church home, we want you here. We want you here. We hope you found the home that you're looking for. Not perfect, never will be. We're flawed. But we sure will love you. And we'll put you to work right away. If you need something today, don't leave here without it. Whatever your need, please respond to the invitation while we stand and sing.